welcome back to 1834 Restoration House. It's a beautiful spring day and we're taking you on a field trip to the Hagen Mill Historic Site. This place has cabins, it has a grist mill, and it even, I'm told, has a moonshine still. Hagen Mill not only has a lot of historic buildings, but it also has a lot of historic machinery and other artifacts around. So this thing here, uh, this is a grinder. You would put your grain in there, be it corn or wheat, and then this would be uh, turned by either power or water power, and, and then it would come out and you'd have this really nice grain. Now over here, this looks to me like an old corn sheller. And so you would drop it in here while you're turning the crank and it would, it would spin it around, it would knock the dry kernels off the corn and that's, that's how you could uh, separate the corn from the kernel um, and then you could drop it in here and make flour out of it. One thing that makes these old buildings so special is the rough sawn lumber. It's not only rough, but it's also extra thick and you'll never find this at Home Depot or Lowe's. Down in the southern states back in the day, a lot of cotton was grown. And here's a piece of cotton. Well, to me, this feels just exactly like what you might find in the grocery store, except if you squeeze it, there's something hard in there. Well, those are the seeds. The seeds and the debris had to be removed before they could spin the cotton into thread. And they had special machinery for that, which we'll show you a little bit later. Up here, we have a random assortment of tools. We have some crosscut saws, candle lanterns, pitchforks, and that back there, I'm not exactly sure what that is. It looks like some kind of long fibrous material. Maybe that's the cotton after it's been cleaned, possibly. This interesting thing here looks like a crank that might have been used to turn some machinery. The interesting thing about it is it has a handle on both ends, as if two men were going to crank it together. We're standing in front of the pottery cabin, and I'd like to show you how this is constructed. So we have logs. And the old timers would chop these apart and make notches in them. And the idea was to make them stack and stay stacked. And then they would fill the gaps up with what they called chinking. Uh, this here appears to be concrete, but back in the day, they most likely would have used mud, straw, uh, whatever they could get their hands on, maybe a little bit of sand in it. One of the early crafts that was practiced in America on the East Coast was that of pottery. And they would have a wheel, which they would turn around and they'd take this, this wet, sticky mud and they were able to form it in all kinds of shapes and then they would let it dry and then they would fire it in a kiln. And that's how they got pottery and earthenware like you see here. Uh, we have some coffee cups, we've got some bowls. We even have what looks to be like flower containers. Since this is a working museum, they actually have pieces and parts that they would, would use to demonstrate with. Uh, here's a bucket of clay that's wet and ready to go. I could take a blob of it right now and set it on there and make something, but I won't. Uh, there's a sponge, and there's also an assortment of tools like knives and uh, shapers and various things. What you're seeing here is simply a stage, which is used for a lot of special events that they hold here throughout the year. They have music festivals and historic reenactments. Let's go take a look at the chicken coop. Take a look at this old chicken coop here. It even has a chicken in there. Chickens were important in the old days because they supplied eggs and meat for the families. They also had one other benefit too, which nobody ever talks about. They eat a lot of bugs. Howdy y'all. Welcome to the historic Haygood Cabin. Before we go inside, I wanna point out a couple of things about its construction. The other cabin we looked at had round logs. This one here has square logs. Not only are they square, but look how big these things are. That's probably a good 18 inches right there. It's huge, but somebody took broad axes and hand hewn these logs into the shape. And they also did this really interesting woodwork here. They cut notches in here so that it would sit down and essentially lock these together. And of course they filled in with chinking. Now the porch is mainly constructed of logs, rough sawn lumber above. But take a look at the roof. That roof up there, hand split cedar shakes. You just don't see that much anymore, uh, but it's really good to see that in its historic form. And even the chimney is made up of dry stacked rock. Come on in, let's take a look at what's inside. This is a good example of a southern cabinet. You might find these in the kitchen. 
This thing here is a, a general workhorse. You can sit on it if you want to, or you can put things on there while you work on them. Uh, it was just a good general tool to have around. And this thing here is what they called a walking wheel. Now you'd be spinning your thread while you turn this wheel right here by hand, and it would make that rotate. And so you just give a little twirl, and then you feed your thread in there like so. And it's a lot of work, yes, but that's how they did things back in the good old days. Now check this machine out here. This uh, is a swinging churn. We've all seen the butter churns in cartoons where they pump the thing up and down in this kind of a upside down bucket shaped thing. And that's how they made their butter. Well, if you were really modern, you had one of these. You pour your cream in there and you just rock it. See how much easier that is. Way back in the good old days, the fireplace was probably one of the most important things to a family. That is dry stacked stone. There's very little mortar in there maybe just a tiny bit here and there, but for the most part, it's just dry stacked, which is a testament to the builders. And uh, this giant hearth here is really just a big log. But light was had by oil lanterns. And back in the old days, before we had kerosene, they might have used whale oil. Down here, you can see in the andirons, there's a hook right there. So you could take your cookware and hang it there, and the heat of the fire would actually cook whatever it was you were cooking with. And of course you had your assortment of tools, the fire poker, and this was here to move coals or, or take ashes out. Today we take our laundry for granted. We've got our Frigidaires and we've got our Maytags. We throw our clothes in, we hit a button and walk away. But back in the old days, it was a little more complicated. You would take this big iron kettle here, fill it full of water and get it hot. And then you take your clothes and you wash those clothes in the kettle. And then you could bring them over here in this other machine here, which is an agitator. You lift this up, put your clothes underneath it, and roll it back and forth. And that basically scrubs the clothes against the rollers. When you're done with that, here's the ringer. You can wring out that excess water. And if you're really smart, you could take that kettle over here, wring that excess water back into the kettle, and use it over again. But then, what do you do when you're done? Well, you either have a clothesline outside, or you have an indoor clothesline, which is these two rails, which spread across from these two stands. And the heat of the fire in the room would warm the clothes and eventually they would dry. So what do you do back in the good old days when you don't have a shopping mall to go buy your clothes at? Well, you had to make your own. But wait, what do you make your own clothes out of? Cloth? But wait a minute, where do you buy your cloth if you're way out in the middle of nowhere? Well, I hate to tell you this, but you're gonna to have to make your cloth too. So you would have either raised sheep or grown cotton. And then you spin the fibers from that into threads. This machine here is called a loom. And what they did is they took those threads, some of which may have been dyed, and they tied them on to this elaborate array of, of thread here in patterns. And then they would bring it back onto this rail right here and then onto the take up roller. Now, how do you weave? Well. You step on that, and that separates the threads. And then you would run a shuttlecock through here to the other side, and then you would take this arm and pull it back like that. And then you step on the next pedal, and that changes the pattern. You run your shuttlecock back through again, pull it up like that, nice and tight and then just do that over and over and over and over again. But eventually you get this really beautiful fabric right here. One thing you absolutely had to have out here was firewood. And that meant cutting it down and chopping it up into pieces. Oh, and then you had to dry it for an entire year before it was any good. It was always nice to have a handy supply of wood next to the house, but that wasn't enough to get you through the entire winter, so the well-equipped farm had a woodshed. So you would stack your wood out here nice and neat, all chopped up and ready to go, and then over time the wood would dry out. Did you ever have a hankering for a good pizza? Well, let me show you the pizza oven right there. No, that's not really a pizza oven. So. In the south, it gets really hot. Do you really want to heat your cabin up by cooking, having a fire running all day? Well, no, not really. So why not have an outdoor oven instead? 
that keeps the heat outdoors and keeps the cabin cool inside. So you can light the fire down here. All that heat will rise up and warm this oven up. But you could also put the fire right here in the oven too and burn it down to coals. And then you could put whatever you want in there and let it cook. And if you're so inclined, you could make pizza. When you're out here in the middle of nowhere, back in the good old days, and you needed to build something, you'd use whatever you had on hand, right? Well, how about a couple of old worn out millstones? This nice log cabin you see here before you was built by Reverend Murphy in 1791. Not 1891, but 1791. I absolutely love this cabin. I mean, look at that fireplace there. Uh, the craftsmanship, even though it was built in 1791 and may have been rebuilt a couple of times over the years, it still just has a timeless elegance about it. I'd like to draw your attention up here to the right-hand side. That's a drying rack. So if you needed to dry some cloth or something else, you could just hang it there and the heat of the fire would eventually dry it. This interesting contraption here is actually a coffee grinder. You drop your beans in, much like we do today, turn the crank, and now I have a handful of coffee. Let's just put that in there for the next people. Well, in spite of the fact that there's a grist mill right across the river over there, they had a hand crank mill right here. And do you recognize the, the swing churn for the butter? Like was in the other cabin. Now, there probably was children here at one time. There's a little rocking chair, a cradle. And over here, we have an interesting old chest. I don't know if you can see it, but this was hand carved. You can actually feel the ripples in it because it's not perfectly smooth like today would be. And everybody had to have a wash tub, so there's the one for this cabin. Here's some craftsmanship from the local blacksmith. Look at that exquisite detail there. This is all iron. A door knocker. And look at that little piece that he welded on there. And of course the door handle. These old cabins had really simple door latches. This board would come up and then it would sit down in a socket on the door frame and that would keep the door from opening up. Now, during the daytime, you would have a string that you would poke out through this hole and it sticks out through here. And that's how you would open it up. If you want to come in and out, you just pull the string, it lifts this up, and now you can open your door. And to lock the door at night, simply pull the string back in hole that was bored in through the wall of the cabin. Now, I don't know if that was done for reconstruction or something, or if this was some kind of a defensive hole. Now, it could have been a peephole to look outside and see if anybody's coming. It could have been a hole where you could stick a rifle out and, uh, you know, make sure that somebody's not misbehaving themselves out there. I really don't know what it's for, but uh, it's just speculation at this point. If anybody knows, please let me know in the comments. We've all heard of the outhouse. Well, what's the difference between this outhouse and the old outhouse? Well, aside from their choice of building materials, things haven't really changed a whole lot, have they? Now, what if you didn't get along with the local miller? Well, you could always come out here to the stone right here, put your corn down here and use this rock and grind it up yourself. All right, house restoration people, look here. It's not very often that you come across a cabin that's being completely restored. So nothing that we've looked at in the last year can compare to this. I mean, look at that. It's a real honest to God log cabin. Now. Uh, we don't know where it came from. I doubt that it was here on the site originally and was probably brought here. Now they're taking this thing completely apart, putting it back together, and they're making it look like it would have always been here. So let me show you a couple of things. These timbers here are all original. They're so old, they even have termite damage right here. This here, that's horse hair. So they're nailing up horse hair and in some cases putting backer boards in there. Brand new porch deck, brand new tin roof. I mean, how often do you see new work with a tin roof on it? Look at that thing, it's incredible. And everything sits up on a stone foundation. They're not even using bricks, they're using stones. Rough sawn lumber, it's all new, but it's rough sawn just like they would have in the old days. Come on up here, let's take a closer look. 
Stone masons have been out here laying up this brand new chimney. They're using rock and they're using mortar. I don't know if that's lime mortar or, or something more modern, but they're basically just building this thing up like uh, it would have been back in the old days. This cabin is made for short people. Come on in here and check this out. Here's a roll of horse hair. This is what we were talking about a few minutes ago when they stuffed the walls. And now, my friends, the part that we've all been waiting for, the grist mill. This incredible structure has been here a long, long time. Now, what they did was they brought the water from way up above. There was a lake back over there, and that water would come down a long trench, then across this flume right here, turn the corner, and then would pour over the wheel I think they call that an over-the-top wheel or something like that. I forget exactly what the terminology is. But that wheel would then turn. And if you look behind me here, you can see the gears. That is probably one of the largest gear sets that you're ever going to see in your life. And that gear set, of course, would turn a small pinion, which would amplify the, uh, the speed and make it go faster. This wheel is not the original wheel. It's been rebuilt a couple of times in the past because wood rots and they just don't last more than you know a couple of decades. And so occasionally they have to take them apart, replicate the wood and put it back together. Now I understand that this is made of oak, which is a really good wood. That's what they used to make ships out of. Before we go in, I'd like to talk about the construction of this building a little bit. The foundation is again, dry stacked stone. And looking through here, all I see is gaps. I don't see any sign of mortar whatsoever. So this entire building is just sitting on top of stones that are literally stacked on top of each other. The siding itself looks to me about an inch and a quarter thick, super thick wood. Now, back in those days, we didn't worry about caulking and flashing and painting and all that stuff. Who cares? You know, it, uh, it was so thick. The stuff would weather on for decades and decades, or even centuries maybe. And if a board rots, you just pull it off and put a new one on. In some of our past videos, we've shown you sites that were pretty derelict and pretty much busted down. But this place is amazing because so much of it still exists and it still functions. This mill right here can still churn out flour. And in fact, they do. This is the Haygood Mill in Pickens, South Carolina. Okay, my friends, step back in time with me. Welcome to the Haygood Mill. This is one of the few actual working grist mills in the area. Now, you can buy anything that's on this board right here because they actually mill it here every third Saturday of the month. They turn this thing on and they actually start milling flour, corn, buckwheat, uh, you know, yellow grits, white grits, whatever you want, you can get it right here. There's nothing like a time-worn building to take you back into the past. The wood floors in this place have been here for countless decades and thousands, literally thousands of people have walked on them. But there's some neat artifacts here. So here's an old scale. It has a glass top. It's made of heavy cast iron. And it has one of those magnifying glass bubbles here so you can actually see what the weight is. Back there is a more modern version. And that looks like the kind that actually you put two different weights. Maybe you put a weight standard on one side and then put the actual am amount of whatever it is you're trying to weigh out on, on the other side. And when the two are equal, you're in perfect balance. There's an interesting pile of artifacts over here in the corner. Um, part of what you're seeing here are the pulleys and the leather belts that are used to run the machinery. Now that shaft right there is connected to all kinds of interesting mechanisms which eventually hook onto the water wheel we saw outside. So when that water wheel turns, all of this stuff will turn as well. And they have ways of controlling the amount of water that hits the wheel and they can speed it up or slow it down as they need to. But I wanted to show you some other things. We have some pinion gears down here um, and there's some extra belts over here in the corner. But one thing I wanted to show you real quick, this big section of ring gear right here 
is not really a ring gear. What this is, is a piece of wood in a wooden box. Now, every now and then, they may have to make a replacement part for that ring gear. So what they'll do is they'll pack this box full of sand, casting sand, and the casting sand takes on the shape of this gear right here. And then they pop it out, and then they pour molten metal into it. And they'll actually recast this section of ring gear. Down there is a pinion gear. That one is the same thing. It's also a piece of wood. And they'll use that to make the pattern, to make the sand casting, so that they can replicate that if they ever need to. Under the mezzanine level here, you can see all of the works. There's a pulley with a belt on it that goes down, and I believe this is the main drive that comes off of the big wheel outside. But there's all kinds of controls here, like this pipe here. These chains actually move controls. And this is really what starts and stops the machine. But you can see all the pinion gears, the shafts, the pulleys, the chains. This place is completely mechanical and completely driven by water power. We've all heard the phrase, keep your nose to the grindstone. Well, that phrase originated from this guy right here. This is a grindstone, and there's a seat right there that the grinder would sit on, and he'd put his tool on there, and he'd turn that wheel, and he'd grind that tool and sharpen it up really nice, and that's where the phrase came from. Keep your nose to the grindstone. This is the heart of the grist mill right here. If you lift this lid up and you pour your grain in there, it's going to drop down in between grindstones and pop out the other side as flour. So what if you're running a grist mill and people start loving your flour so much that they buy too much of it and you can't keep up with demand? Well, how about if you get another grinder and hook it in and run it off the belt power system that you're already running with your other one? So this is another one that they use, and it does exactly the same thing, only the flower comes out that little chute right there. Summers are very hot here in the south, so what if you're working the mill in the middle of August, you got your windows open, but the air is just not moving, it's just stifling hot. What do you do? Well, you've got water power, you're already powering two grinders, could you might possibly have enough power to power a fan? So you rig up a belt, and a pulley, and you take some of that extra power that you have from the water wheel and you turn a fan. Not just one, but two. Well, you're getting on close to the 20th century. I wouldn't be surprised if they had some kind of electric power generator here too to light the lights. This machine here is called a clipper cleaner, and even though it's electric, it serves a valuable function. You put your grain in here, and it has screens of different sizes, and it separates the good stuff from the waste. Over here, this looks like a homemade contraption, and it's not really evident what it does right offhand, so I'm not going to speculate. And the same with this one here, probably was built by the miller. And this here, this is extremely old. I don't know if you can see it very well, but we have what's called the smutter. It says here, the machine is used to clean wheat before it was ground into flour. The wheat berry has a beard on one end and a germ on the other. The smutter bounces the berry off the screen to knock the beard and the germ off, leaving you with just the good stuff. And it's, it's an amazing machine, just really incredible craftsmanship. It's, I mean, you, you just don't see this kind of stuff today. Part of living out here means you have to have water. Now, we've got a nice creek out here, but Look at this water out here. This is pretty nasty. Do you really want to be drinking and cooking with this? Or you could sink a well in the ground and you could just pump your own water. Let's see if we can get some nice fresh water here. That's what I'm talking about. Good and clean. Hey y'all, we got white lightning over here. You want some white lightning? Come on in. Shh, shh, shh. Don't tell no one. We got white lightning in here. Come on in.
Mr. Eli Whitney. Everybody knows this man because he invented what? The cotton gin. And it was the cotton gin that led to the rapid expansion of industry in the South, mainly the textile industry. Now, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, but in 1890, Daniel Pratt came up with this machine. The basic technology of the cotton gin consists of two counter-rotating drums that are full of fine wires. Those fine wires pick and pull at it and comb it out. All of the debris falls out and so do the seeds, leaving you with a thin film of super fine cotton. This cotton gin appears to be powered by a steam motor. This whole setup was used up until the 1950s when it was finally retired. This machine here is a two-story cotton baler. No old village is complete without a blacksmith shop. This brick thing that we're looking at right now is the centerpiece of the blacksmith shop. It's called a coal forge. And up on top, you can see piles of coal, and that's what gets hot, and that's where the blacksmith does his work. Over on the left-hand side, covered up in green cloth, is a set of bellows. And so what he does is he grabs that big wooden handle up there and he pulls on it repeatedly. That operates the bellows and makes it blow air into the forge. The air makes the coals get a whole lot hotter than they would if they were just burning on their own. They need as much heat as they can get because they want that iron to be red hot, yellow hot, maybe even white hot. This is a blacksmith's anvil. This particular one was made in Sweden, which is unusual because most of these old time uh, anvils would have been made in America, but nonetheless, it serves the same function. So you've heard the term, strike while the iron is still hot. Well, that came right straight from the blacksmith shop. So he would pull that iron out of the coals. It's glowing hot, probably an, a bright orange color, maybe even close to white. And he'd put it up on that anvil and he'd start pounding on it with a hammer. And that is strike while the iron is still hot. Thank you for coming along on this field trip as we visit the Hagen Mill Historic Site in Pickens, South Carolina. Now we have a whole bunch more video coming at you soon. Uh, we'll have some more house videos, some more restoration videos, and even a couple field trips here and there we'll throw in for good measure. So thanks for watching. If you like this, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel.